All right, so this is going to go with type 3. All right, so type 3, again, it's for low-pressure systems. Now, not every chiller, which the chiller looks like this right here. Where's the, uh, all right, first, before we even get into chiller, this is another type of air conditioning system. If I had a space, like a, whole, a tall high-rise, where we couldn't put a bunch of these condensing units up on the roof or down on the ground because there's too many units, there's like a thousand apartments in a high rise or something. We can't put a thousand of these condensing units around. They usually will feed a unit similar to this, all right? And this unit would be in the space, in the house, in the apartment, all right? Usually off in the corner somewhere behind a wall with an access panel for us to get to it. Now, this is a water cooled condenser. In other words, they're not using air as their heat transfer medium to blow over that condenser coil. They're using a tube and tube type system. So that's like these, instead of having a condenser fan motor, then they got these tube and tube condensers. So they got the refrigerant flowing through one tube, okay, and then they got the water flowing through another tube. So they got an inlet for the refrigerant and an outlet for the water. And then they got a outlet for the refrigerant on the other side and in, and the inlet for the water. So it's, uh, it's got, really it's a pipe in a pipe. They call it tube in a tube. So here's a couple different ones here. Here's where I would connect up the water. Here's where I would connect up the refrigerant line. And again, instead of using air as a medium because they can't fit a bunch of these units around, they can put this in the space, in the apartment unit, and then they can just feed water to it. And then the water that absorbs, the, the, what happens is you still got a fan coil, all right, a fan unit for the evaporator that's going to blow air, cold air into the space. But as it's absorbing the heat from the space, that heat's getting transferred to this, in, to the water inside the tube. And then this water's being carried away to a chiller probably to get the heat removed from that. All right, so I'm going to pass this around and let you take a look at it. It's almost like a cascade system where, you know, and think about the ice machine. If, you're, if that ice machine was running, and you walk over by the ice machine, how's it gonna feel over by the ice machine? Huh? Hot, warm. Because what are you feeling? What, where's all that hot air coming from? Why does it feel hot around the ice machine? Because it's taking the heat from the water. Yes, it's pulling the heat out of the water. It's pulling the heat out of the water so fast that it's causing the water to freeze into a sheet of the ice. And that's really what we're doing. So think about this now. What, how am I gonna get, because I don't want that heat in this space, how am I going to get the heat outside? Okay. No, not a vent. I got to have another system, another air conditioning system. So think about this. As we run that ice machine, it's pulling the heat out of the water, and then it's putting it in this space here. All right? And then I got to get the heat from this space here, plus there's our heat from us generating lights, that heat. That heat gets carried away through the AC system and then carried away outside. So that's sort of like a cascade system where we got one thing working against another. Same thing into here. So what they're doing is they're absorbing all the heat from the apartment unit into the water, and then they're carrying the water uh, up to another, another chiller, which looks like this. All right, so this is what the chiller looks like in, in one part of the building, and it used to be in the penthouse. What's up with this? Okay, chiller right here. So that's it. That's the refrigeration cycle. If I was to draw this, it would be exactly the same as the refrigeration cycle that you draw as the baseball diamond. You got the compressor, that's this piece up here. Now this is a centrifugal compressor, different than all the others I've shown you. You've got the condenser, that's gonna be a barrel on the other side. And then you got the metering device, that's gonna be in between the two barrels. So the amount of liquid fed in from the condenser to the evaporator, if the metering device is in the condenser, it's gonna be a high side control, all right? They call it a high side float. If you've ever opened up the back of your toilet, you ever, who's opened up the back of the toilet? What do you see? A float valve, a little ball. And how does the water turn on when you flush the toilet? The ball drops, right? And then that opens up a valve and let, lets water feed. The same thing is what they use for a meter device between the high and the low side of the system. And if that ball's in the high side, that's a high side float. If the ball's in the low side, it's a low side float but it's still got a metering device. And then this is the evaporator barrel because there's my suction line going back up to the compressor in the center, all right? So we still got our evaporator, everything's here. It's just much larger than what we're doing with these semi-hermetic open hermetic compressors here. 
And because it's moving so much heat, the heat's not going to be air. It's going to be water. So usually what we got going on with this is instead of it being, you know, where we would draw it normally like a coil, it's a barrel. And what they have is they have these pipes running through the barrel. Let me show you a picture. So the, if it didn't have this, a water-cooled condenser, it could have this, a fan coil unit. So here they're taking the water and they're pumping the chilled water. All right, this is sort of what you brought in. This is a little different, but it's the same thing, where they're pumping the chilled water in through the loops instead of refrigerant. And it's 40 degree water coming in, and then by the time the fan motor blows over that water, it warms it up to 50 degrees going out, and then comes back to the chiller to get cooled down again to 40 degrees. So here's a fan coil unit, and then that's a coolant tower. So here we got on the evaporator side over here, I don't know if I'll be able to draw it pretty good, but on the evaporator side, we usually got a pump. And the pump's pumping water this way to a fan coil unit, right? And then it comes back down to the evaporator through tubes. And it goes through tubes, and then it comes back up. So when it's coming out, it's coming out about 40 degrees Fahrenheit right here, and then it goes through here, and then the fan motor blows air over it. The air is probably 75 degrees going to the coil and 55 degrees coming out of the coil. And that heat, that heat, the temperature that's dropping because the heat's getting absorbed into the water. Now the water's not boiling like what we do with our refrigerant and evaporator. The water's just warming up from 40 degrees coming in to 50 degrees going out. And then it goes back into the evaporator barrel. And then all that heat gets carried through the compressor to the water-cooled condenser, to the condenser barrel. And the condenser barrel then also has pipes, and I'm going to do these ones in red, that run out to one of these, the coolant tower. So we got a, that worker's done. We got an outlet, again, just like that other one. We got an outlet here where I'll have a water pump, and that pump's going to go, really, actually, it's just another box that sprays the water on the top, and then the water has got on the side of the coolant tower these slats to go down and it goes down these slats. And then naturally the wind blows through those slats and that causes the temperature of the water. It might be coming out 90 degrees, all right? Because it absorbed 10 degrees of heat over here. By the time it leaves on the bottom and goes back to the barrel, it's gonna be 80 degree water, all right? So we get about 10 degree and then it just goes through loops inside the barrel. So we got the heat from the space in the apartment unit getting transferred to the water, warming the water up, and we take that warm water and we cool it back down in the evaporator, and then the cycle, the chiller, takes that heat that it absorbed in the evaporator, puts it in the condenser, all to transfer to this water system, and this water system feeds to an outside cooling tower like that here. And if there's not enough wind to change the temperature of the water from 90 down to 80 degrees, then they gotta have a, a fan motor that would kick on to help circulate that air. And usually when the fan motor kicks on, that's when you're seeing a lot of, it looks like smoke, but it's water vapor coming off the top of the buildings. So you can see the water vapor coming off the top of the buildings. Here's some of the stuff. Now this is part of the commercial work that some of the commercial guys do. This is big money here. This is what Trade Masters does. All right, so these guys here, they're maintaining, they gotta make sure that the water doesn't build up a lot of algae and no mold mildew gets on these slats. They gotta clean everything out. And they gotta make sure the pH is right. There's no calcium buildup. So they really gotta do a little bit of water treatment. It's not just all about air conditioning because the water's gotta be, you know, they can't build up scale inside the tubes and in the pipes because that'll reduce the heat transfer and make it inefficient. And then we're wasting electricity. So fan coil unit, chiller, Coolant tower. That's how we're transferring the heat on a type three system. Here's a cutaway view. So now you're seeing the barrel. All right, you're looking at it. We got our compressor right here. So the gas is getting kicked out and going to the condenser. All right, and as it makes contact with the water right here, the heat transfers from the refrigerant, the hot gas, to the water, and that causes it to change into a liquid. So really, this barrel would be about halfway filled with liquid right here, right? And then that liquid 
then would transfer its uh, energy into the heat, a little extra heat, all right, and give us that liquid to feed. Which way is it going here? We're gonna go, uh, it's going up and then down. And then where are we going out of it? I don't see it on this diagram. Okay, here we go. All right, so then, yeah, so that's going to the cooling tower, all right? So then the liquid is feeding down into, through a metering device, uh, there's my meter device. Okay, right into here, into the evaporator. All right, so the evaporator is going to get all this liquid and it's going to change the pressure from high pressure liquid to low pressure liquid. And then as this liquid comes in contact with the heat that's in this water in the tubes, it's going to cause that liquid refrigerant to boil and then get sucked back to the compressor to go back to the condenser barrel to change back into a liquid. Goes through the medium device, goes into the evaporator barrel, boils off going back to a gas, gas gets sucked back, and that's the cycle for a chiller. Now you've got these air handling or fan coil units and these cooling towers that connect up there. You can't just have the chiller. There's no point for just a chiller. You've got to have some sort of medium to transfer the heat both to the outside and to the space inside the building. But people used to, they could be in the basement, but they're hard to get in and out of a basement. So a lot of times they put them up in the penthouse floor. All right, they're on the top floor of a building, usually. And then the cooling tower is up on the roof. Any questions about what I've said so far? Okay, because there's some components you're gonna need to know about that deal directly with this chiller. Oh, the thing didn't take it. That was, that was a nice cutaway picture, um, the copyright. So here's another view of an evaporator chiller. This is where the rupture disc is located. I got a picture of a rupture disc that I hope comes up from the slideshow that I made a little bit. But the rupture disc would be connected to the chiller barrel and it's, it's a low pressure system. We do not, the rupture disc, you should be writing all this stuff down. I don't see much writing. But rupture disc is set to blow at 15 PSI. So for safety reasons, we never want to pressurize the system higher than 10 PSI. So on type three, they're gonna ask you a couple different types of questions. One is, what's the rupture disc set to cut out? And cut out, by cut out, they mean blow. And it's a one-time deal. When the rupture disc blows, because the system got too high a pressure, you gotta replace it. And to keep it safe, to make sure it doesn't blow, anytime we're opening the system for repair, trying to pressurize it for a repair, 10 PSI, <coughs> the highest pressure we want to get to. You have to replace the whole unit or just the disc? Just the disc. And it's a little piece of metal that's designed to blow. Damn, none of the slides showed up. Okay. I had I, the, To clean the tubes, they have to punch them. So I had a slide that showed a chiller barrel, and I'm gonna have to go out of the PowerPoint to go to the website to show you. Um, but they're just all tubes in a barrel. Now, Look at your PT chart real quick. Get your PT chart from your, your packet. Because I want you to look across on your PT chart and tell me at 40 degrees what refrigerant's in a vacuum at 40 degrees. So look at temperature degrees Fahrenheit. All right. And I want you to look 40 degrees and go across and tell me what, were, what temperature, what refrigerants are in a vacuum at 40 degree temperature. So yeah, R11, see the parentheses? That means it's not positive pressure, 15.6. That's in a vacuum by 15.6. What's the other one? R123. R123, yeah. At 40 degrees, its pressure's slightly lower at 15 PSI, which means if you get a leak in this barrel on the, anywhere on the low side of the system, that's in a vacuum. Those leaks don't leak out refrigerant they actually suck air in. Because this half of the system right here, this half of the low side of the system, is below atmospheric pressure, right? Being 14.7 pounds. It doesn't have that. It's running in 15 inches of mercury for a 40 degree coil. And then by the time it comes out 50 degree refrigerant, superheated 10 degrees, back to the compressor, what's the pressure at 50 degrees for R11? 40 degrees was 15.6. It raised up three inches in mercury. It's what, 13, 12. 12. 12 inches in mercury. 
So look, the pressure's going up, but the number's going down because it's reverse. It's a vacuum. So a vacuum, when this number gets smaller, means we're losing the vacuum or the pressure's going up, okay? So all this is in the low side of the system. So these gaskets, if they got gaskets to connect the metering device to the evaporator or the evaporator to the compressor, if they sit for a long period of time, like this rotating shaft seal on an open drive compressor, that can leak. The same thing with these gaskets in the chiller barrel, they can leak. The only difference is all these other refrigerants are positive pressure. R11, R123, they operate on the low side below atmospheric pressure, so they suck, when they leak, they suck air in. And then all that air is gonna connect, collect in the top of the condenser barrel. So if I get air sucked in anywhere on the low side, let's say we got a leak here, then that air is gonna come in with the refrigerant, get moved with the compressor to the chiller barrel, uh, the chiller condenser barrel, and then that air is gonna take up space in the top of the condenser. That actually happens in these direct expansion coils as well. You don't get all the air out because you don't run the vacuum, then the first couple passes up top are gonna to take up space with air. What's that gonna to do to our refrigeration? If I got air here and I'm missing one-tenth of the space of the coil, all right, or one-tenth of the barrel here, because refrigerant can't go here with the air, there's, you know, refrigerant's heavier than air, therefore the air goes up. Losing efficiency. I'm losing efficiency, yeah. So they got this thing called a purge unit. That's what this is. The purge unit is located at the top of the condenser, and it's just a pipe with a machine that looks just like this that sucks the air out. Now, when it sucks the air out, it's also going to suck out some of the refrigerant, the high-pressure vapor, all right, because it's all mixed together, really. But so some of the refrigerant gets mixed out. So this purge unit used to be it just sucked out the air, and you'd hear it blow out the side of the building somewhere. There'd be a half-inch copper tube somewhere stuck out. All right, and you hear it run. If you hear it running like four, five, six times a day, sucking the air out, what does that mean about our chiller system here? We got a leak, yeah. So we don't want to hear it running. And then it's got to take the refrigerant, separate it from the air, because refrigerant will condense, and that refrigerant's getting put back in the tank here, or getting put back in the system, really. It'll go in the low side of the system. So we're not wasting refrigerant. All right, so you got the purge unit, you got the rupture disc, all right, here's some other components. So there's where the rupture disc is located right there. It's pretty much a pressure relief. They got another relief valve, but that's the pressure relief for the system. If I had to open the system for repair, I wouldn't want to open it up while it's in a vacuum. So I might, my first method for pressurizing the system to open it for repair is to either get a hot blanket, a heater blanket, or circulate hot water through it. If I got a hot water heater or a boiler, I'll take it, connect it up, to the inlet and I'll raise. What's gonna to happen to the refrigerant when I run hot water over it? It's gonna go up, pressure's gonna go up. So then I can open it. So there's a hierarchy to the system. If I, if I got hot water, that's what I'm gonna choose first. If I don't have hot water, I'm gonna try and get a heater blanket and wrap it with a heater blanket. And then the last thing I can use is pressurized nitrogen. I can put nitrogen in the system because it'll get sucked out by the purge unit. Again, nitrogen, it's like most, mostly air anyway. It'll collect here at the top of the condenser. So if they're asking you on the test for type three, what's the best method? And they'll give you all three of those answers on the sheet. You gotta know to pick controlled hot water first, heater blanket second, and nitrogen third. They're all correct, but the best method is to use controlled hot water, all right? And then the chiller barrel for the condenser is on the other side, and this is where they would connect the purge unit. There's the rupture disc there, right there. So you, uh, once it blows, it's a one-time deal. Here's the hot, to test the tubes. So here's the tubes I'm talking about. What, the refrigerant would be just sitting all over these tubes. About, if it was the condenser, halfway, all right? And then what's happening is water, let me do that in blue, is flowing through these tubes. Now, if I get the temperature of the refrigerant below 32 degrees, what's gonna happen to the water in the tubes? How much colder? What happens to water when it gets below 32 degrees? It freezes. it freezes. What happens to water when it freezes? It expands. Does it got room to expand in a copper tube? What's it going to do? Burst. It's going to burst the tube. So we got if we if we hear the purge unit run it, maybe it's sucking in water, right? All right. So you gotta 
use this tool here and it pressurizes each tube to do, that's called a hydrostatic test tube kit. Hydrostatic test tube kit, all right? So if you suspect a tube leaking, you're not getting an electronic leak sniffer, because you can't get into the barrel. You got to get one of these and pressurize it and you see the pressure drop, you know that tube's leaking. And they don't do nothing but plug it off. They won't fix that pipe. They're not, you know, they'll just plug that particular tube off and it's gonna be that much less efficient, but at least they don't have to replace the unit. So, all right, let me see if I can show you some of the pictures that I got real quick, and then we'll let you do your type three. I right, only got like five minutes, so it's gonna be tomorrow. And I'll collect money the last two, three minutes from those who got it, and then uh, I think once you look at the, once you look at the type three again, now that you've seen some pictures, it might be a little bit more helpful. Mr. Neal. Hey, sir. How, how are you? you doing? I'm good. I'm looking for Adam Wells. He's not in here. Huh? He's not in here. All right. All right. So there's the rupture disc. Uh, let's see if I can get a picture of the barrels. That's the purge unit. That's another cycle. There's the cooling tower, fan coil unit. Let me just type in. Chiller barrel. And images. All right, so here's all the barrels. This is it. And here's where the water comes in and the water goes out. So they also got a pump. There's the end. All right. The best place to check is the drain valve. If this, if I got refrigerant leaking, I'll remove all the water and shove my electronic leak detector in there. And then that lets me know that my leaks in this barrel or in the other barrel. Because if it goes off here out of that drain valve, all right, then it's letting me know that one of these tubes is leaking. All right, this leak is split somewhere. Okay. Or they also call it the evaporator charging valve. I can get it through an evaporator charging valve. But there's a side view cutaway of what the chiller barrel looks like, and it's just tubes. Uh, they don't show it. They want they want they want me to pay for that. That's the price. Yeah. There's another picture of another, that's a York chiller there. So, okay, real quick. No, not that one. So this is going to be anybody, okay? Anybody that works on Type 3 equipment, you're going to want this to get the universal. So again, low pressure chiller, operating below atmospheric. It uses that shell type system instead of the direct expansion like what you're used to right here, all right? Low pressure refrigerant absorbs the heat and it's carried with water, usually water in the evaporator side and water in the high side. Okay, it's going to circulate throughout that building and then it's going to circulate outside the building to a coolant tower where we can dispose of that heat and nobody cares about it, all right? The basic chiller itself is the normal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And the system's protected from overpressurization by a rupture disc located on the evaporator. The rupture disc is set to blow at 15 PSI. And because low pressure equipment is type three, and that type three means, and you could have an R22 chiller, that's a type two unit because it's boiling point for R22s between negative 50 and 50. The refrigerants for low pressure, the R11, R123, at 50 degrees, they're in a vacuum, okay? And then the air surrounding, what's up with that? I can't get it. Leaks in the gaskets will cause air to enter the system, okay? So we gotta make sure it's tight. The purge unit located at the condenser, and that's the way they're gonna use the term instead of air, non-condensables. The nitrogen won't condense as part of our refrigeration cycle. 
So it calls it a non-condensable, which is why it stays above the liquid refrigerant and the vapor refrigerant in the condenser barrel. To do a leak test, it's not going to be the same with electronic leak detector, which is why I showed you the hydrostatic test tube kit. Best way for checking for leaks, if I got to raise the pressure, controlled hot water, then heater blankets, and then the last, if I can't get the one or the two, is nitrogen. But if you're putting in nitrogen, you got to make sure the regulator is not set higher than 10 PSI. Because what pressure does the rupture disc blow? 15. 15. All right. Where is it located? Yes. Okay. So here, leak testing. That side, that pipe, that piece that I showed you with all the tubes going in the end, that's called a water box. That's where the water circulates from one end of the barrel to the other. So like I said, best way to leak the test, take all the water out, and because refrigerant's heavier than air, it'll come out through the drain valve. You can do the same thing on any of the systems. If I had to do a quick leak check and I don't want to go and take the covers off, I'll just pull the drain plug and then throw my probe in there, make sure there's no water. But if I do suspect the tube's leaking because it froze the water, then it's going to expand it and burst the tube. We've got to test each tube to make sure. Major, again, condenser, compressor, uh, metering device, but they don't have that. They call it the auxiliary heat exchange coil and evaporator. Any one of those components is a major repair. Again, it's got to have more than 50 pounds, and these systems have more than 50 pounds. That chiller I showed you, if it's R11, could have 350 pounds of refrigerant. That's like eight of those drums, nine of those drums filled up at 40 pounds. That's a lot, all right? Could have 450 pounds, 350 pounds of refrigerant. And even after you recover all the, va all the liquid, it could still have uh, 100 pounds of vapor in it. Right? If you're using a water-cooled water -cooled condenser, you could have a recovery machine because it's a bigger machine. Water-cooled condenser gets hooked up to the municipal water supply. So I'll probably have a garden hose hooked up to my recovery machine at the water for the water inlet instead of it being an air-cooled condenser. And everything's got to be on. The recovery compressor, the pumps for the water circulating so they don't freeze, and then the municipal water supply. Everything's got to be on. All right, feeders, you got to go.